What if what looks empty is only waiting to be filled? What if what looks like the end is really only the beginning? What if the places that have run dry won't always be that way? What if the empty places in our hearts were made to be filled with laughter? <laughs> what if when something runs out, it's the beginning of so much more? What if what appears empty is only waiting to be filled? What if the story is true? At early dawn, they went to the tomb and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus there. What if the story of Easter is anything but empty. Well, good morning. morning. My name's Kyle. I work here at uh, Real Life, and I'm um, really blessed to work with really the greatest staff in Shalane and Brewster and the greatest board. Um, Really, we're really blessed. I'm thankful. Uh, welcome to everybody. Brewster, good to have you with us. And if you're in our online church tuning in, um, Mom in Iowa and the lovely Darlene, she's in uh, Boise. Pause for effect. Uh, where's my mother in law? Uh, <laughs> that's funny. That, that's going over big in uh, Eagle, Idaho right now. Uh, hey, listen. Uh, I love uh, working at Real Life, and uh, you guys are all super normal, both in Brewster and Chelan. Uh, but I've been raised in, uh, I've been a professional Christian a long time because I was born into a pastor's family and uh, been in Christian settings my entire life. And what I know for sure is not all Christians are as normal as you all. Some of you maybe were with me. This was a long time ago. In 1999, I was at the Creation Music Festival down at the Gorge. And they announced from the stage that at midnight, this is like July 16th, at midnight, they would be releasing the new, newest VeggieTales video, Larry Boy and the Rumor Wheat. Nerds. If you grew up watching VeggieTales, give me a whoop, whoop. Yeah, man, they were great. I didn't, but my kids did. So I'm at Creation Music Festival, and they say, if you want to get a copy, it's at midnight, the first people to be able to buy Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed are only people at Creation at this moment, midnight, July 16th. So I think, well, I don't really care about busy sales, but my daughters do. And Aubrey was nine, little Libby was five. I said, I'm the best dad in the world. I'm going to go. I'm going to stay up till midnight. Creation, no one goes to bed anyway. Uh, I'm going to stay up till midnight. I'm going to go down. I'm going to get a copy. I'm going to take it home. I'm going to be the greatest dad in the world. So I go down, you know, at, Cre at any festival, they have all these tents. And so the bookstore was under a tent. And I go in there and I'm like, uh-oh, this is not going to be what I thought. This place is full of people, adults, not little kids. Adults. And I thought, well, I'm an adult too. I'm here. And so the person in charge gets up there and says, all right, tonight in 35 minutes, we're going to be releasing Larry Boy and the Rumor Week. And I'm like, 35 minutes? Just give me my video. We're all going to watch it. The debut of it, we're all going to watch it together. And I'm like, all right, I love my kids, but 35 minutes. So they start the video, and we're packed in there, sitting on the grass in this tent. We're packed in there, and Larry Boy comes on the screen, and these people go crazy. <laughs> yeah, Larry Boy. They're growing adults, and I, I thought, what contest in hell did I lose that I'm sitting in the middle of these weirdo Christians? 
It's just a cartoon. You would have thought Olivia and John was performing in the tent. I cut, listen, I love Larry Boy as much as the next guy, but these people were going crazy. So I endured that, got my video, and I walked out of there and I thought, wow, if all these Christians are going to be in heaven, I don't know about going or not. <laughs> Some of you are offended because you're weird. <laughs> listen, yeah, listen, if you're here and you're not yet a believer and this is your first time in church in a while or you're tuning in and you're sitting in Brewster, we know there are a bunch of strange Christians. Some of us are weird. Some of us choose different paths. Some of us have different morals. But some of you that are standing outside looking in right now, and I hope you don't stand there forever, would say, I don't understand Christianity. Because it seems like some of the Christians I know actually resist the God they say they trust. Like they're all about Jesus and they're all about following Jesus. But why is it sometimes it seems like they're in a tug of war with the Almighty? Like, why do they say they believe one thing and do the other? It's like they're, they're struggling. And maybe outside of Christianity, but certainly uh, within the halls of uh, every institution, people look at Christians who struggle and resist the God they say they trust, and we call that what? Hypocrisy. Of which I'll lead the charge. I know what it's like. I know what the commands of Christ are. I know what the call to being a loving person is. I know what I signed up for and what I try to sign up for every day as I follow Jesus. But I also know the tension and struggle that I have sometimes when God isn't doing what I want him to do the right way or fast enough. I shared with the staff this week at Tuesday staff meeting, like, yeah, you know, I hear God's Holy Spirit say, Kyle, you should do this, you should do that all the time. And 50% of the time, I do it. That leaves another 50% where I'm saying, yeah, I hear you, God, I ain't doing that. Why is that? That's strange. It's not as strange as a grown adult cheering for Larry Boy, but it's still strange, right? Why is it? Maybe it's just me. I know, and I bet you would agree, if you've been a follower of Jesus for any amount of time at all, that we struggle, we get in this tug of war with God because surrendering control is terrifying. Especially to me and people like me who are anagram eights, type A, we want to be in control because we think when we're in control, we can control outcomes and nothing bad's ever going to happen to us. So giving control to anybody, that's why I drive and, my, and Darlene rides. I'm not going to give her control of my truck. I, the thought of, okay, God, you take it, I'll give up. I'm going to release, I'm going to surrender, I'm going to release control. That's scary. This series, we're trying to look at the story of Easter and a lot of people that brought us the story of Easter and, and characters in the story that we don't often talk about. I want to kind of fill in the blanks of some of these people. And as we fill in the blanks, maybe as we fill in the blanks about who these people were in history, it fills in the blanks for your life as well. Because some of you may have showed up today and for whatever reason, kicked over a trash can while you came into the third row. It was an ashtray. Sorry, Brewster, we have a little commotion. The high school boys were out loading up stuff and got a bottle of Jack Daniels on their way in. So we're, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. We'll be okay. Yeah, listen, some of you, I don't, I don't know how you, what you showed up in condition today. Some of you may be a father of Jesus and you're like, yeah, I gave, up, I gave up control a long time ago and it's the best time I've ever had. But most of us, are either 
coming out of a time, entering a time, or just a week or two away from a time where we're like, yeah, God, I don't know. I don't want to do that. Or you're not coming through the way I want. You may feel like Noah Khan stuck in stick season where like it's not autumn and it's not winter, it's just dead. You know, like, I don't know, this ain't going, I better start. I better take the wheel here and see what I can do. There's people in the story of Easter like that. Last week we talked about Judas and Judas betrayed Jesus, but he didn't hate Jesus. In fact, he loved Jesus, I think, and he just wanted Jesus to act the way he wanted to do to get what he wanted. He wanted to set a bargain with Jesus to get what he wanted. And when Jesus wouldn't do that, he did the ultimate wrong to Jesus. There's other people in this story where they're like, they take control, they think they're doing the right thing, and they think they're going to get what they want, but in the end, it slips away from them. And the thing that we're going to find out is there's a little bit of them in all of us. Because whether you want to believe it or not, and I'll believe it for both of us till you're ready to believe it, when we resist the God who created us, and even if you don't believe this, when we resist the God who loves us and proves it through the sacrifice of his own son and then raises again on Easter Sunday and proves he's not just a dude, when we resist the God who loves us, it's an illustration in futility. Because the very thing that you want and you're trying to hang on to, as you resist and resist and resist God, slowly that thing disappears anyway. And you're back to square one. There's no greater example of this in the Easter story than this guy named Joseph Caiaphas. Joseph Caiaphas, and maybe you've run into him, and his name only comes up in the Easter story. Because he's the one that's standing there and, and, and pronounces some judgment on Jesus when he gets arrested. Joseph Caiaphas is the Jewish high priest, and that's a big deal. It's not just, ah, he's a pastor of a church. He's the man in Jerusalem. He's the man in all Israel. He's the most powerful and influential Jew in Israel. He is the Taylor Swift of first century Israel. No? I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Who's more influential? All right, all right, I'll start over. He is the Beyonce of first century Israel. No? He's the Dan Marino of first... No? He's the most powerful and influential Jew in Israel. Bam. Bam. Uh, and here's why. When you control the temple, you control it all. It's not like it is today. Even like, oh, the Pope and the Vatican and Rome and everything. This is so much. This guy had it all. He had it all because not only was he the high priest that controlled the temple, which means he controlled the people, but he's from a line of people. His father-in-law, his five brothers-in-law, they had controlled the temple. They were a dynasty for over 40 years of being controlling of the temple. And the reason controlling the temple was so great because he had extraordinary wealth because everybody got temple taxed. People that lived in Jerusalem and people who were scattered all over the place. And Jews, no matter where they lived, sent their money to the temple because they wanted to stay in, in good graces with God. So that meant they had to give their money and give their money. And we're talking equivalent to millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And Caiaphas was in charge of that. Caiaphas had all the money. Caiaphas was cruising along and his life was great. You ever been that way? You're not just cruising down the road of life. Everything's great. Caiaphas was popular. Caiaphas was powerful. Caiaphas was rich, happy. And all of a sudden he has a problem. And his problem is Jesus. Jesus comes in and messes up Caiaphas' life. The problem with Jesus was he was a threat to everything Caiaphas was living for and had been trained to live for. And it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, his teaching. Because a lot of yahoos had come and gone that claimed to be something and claimed to start a new sect or new religion or whatever. Caiaphas has seen those guys. 
But Jesus was radically different, and it was a problem. First of all, Jesus was a problem because of the crowds. Caiaphas and all the temple leaders knew if the crowd was with you, you were going to succeed. If you lose the crowd, you lose security, you lose their votes, you lose, you, you, you lose their support. And slowly, Jesus is drawing a crowd. Like thousands of people. Always hundreds, but sometimes thousands of people. And Caiaphas and the leaders are like, we got to do something about this guy. You lose the crowd, we could have a civil war. If we don't have it all, we, we, we could lose our place. Rome's going to come in and mess with us, even though they're already in control. If they see there's problems, they're going to come in and, and take us off of our, our leadership. They're going to destroy the temple. Not just the crowds, but his authority. Jesus spoke and acted with such strong authority. Remember, even if you haven't been to church a long time, maybe you've heard the story where Jesus is mad. He goes to the temple and he sees all these people are selling stuff inside the temple. And they were taking advantage of people, especially people, poor people or who lack resources, because they were charging people to have to buy a dove or some kind of sacrifice to go get right with God. You had to go in the temple and make a sacrifice. Well, if I don't own that, I have to show up. I don't have anything to sacrifice. So these guys are selling stuff to sacrifice. And they're charging outrageous prices. And Jesus comes in, he sees all this. Remember what he does? He flips over everybody's table and cash goes everywhere and pigeons are flying all over the place. And he just he yells at everybody. And that's kind of a scene. But the temple leaders find Jesus and they don't say, well, what do you think you're doing? They say, who do you think you are? Because they'd never seen a guy like that before. It was a crowd, it was a and then it's, it's constant criticism. Listen, don't do it now. Get some time later. Go to Matthew 23 if you want to see Jesus just go off in a rant. He was constantly criticizing Caiaphas and the religious leaders. He had no respect for the temple because of the way it was being run. At the end of this long rant, can you imagine? This is what he says. You snakes. You wouldn't even let your kids talk like this. You brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? He stands up in front of all the religious leaders, all the power people, all the wealthy people, and he says, you're going to hell. And Caiaphas is like, we got to do something about this guy. He is getting in the way of of our future success, satisfaction, and enjoyment. So here comes the final straw. The final straw between Jesus and Caiaphas and Jesus and the temple leaders, it ain't what he, it, it, it's not something that he said, it's something that he did. And this was like, this was it. This was like three years they're putting up with this Jesus guy. Slowly he rises in popularity. He, it, every week he gets more and more uh, uh, um, um, mean with the temple leaders more he's doing these miracles and now the crowds are coming all over the place and he's becoming more popular than Caiaphas and the temple leaders but what really happened was the final straw where Caiaphas and his buddies said we got to do something is he raised a person from the dead anyone know who that was yep Lazarus he's in Bethany his buddy Lazarus dies, he shows up, he rises him from the dead, and the crowd goes crazy. When that moment hit, something inside Caiaphas and his buddy said, we better do something because the thing we're holding on to that's going to bring us all the joy and satisfaction in life was starting to slip through our fingers. John, disciple of Jesus, close friend of Jesus, wrote down the story of Jesus because he was there. The book of Acts tells us that after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead and the gospel of Jesus started spreading and the followers of Jesus started talking about Jesus after he went and ascended to heaven, that many of the temple leaders became followers of Jesus. So John had his information because he hung out with Jesus and he had his information because these temple leaders told him what happened. So John tells us, now the crowd that was with Jesus when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. 
It's growing and growing and growing. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So all the Pharisees, all the religious leaders, all the Sadducees, all the religious leaders, all the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. The way we've been dealing with this guy isn't working. We've been trying to ask tricky questions and making him look stupid in public. We've been trying to catch him uh, contradicting the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. And they're like, this ain't working. We got to sharpen our swords and get to get busy because this is he's taking us under. Uh, they had no idea. I love it that they said a little exaggeration, right? The whole world's gone after him. It's just little Jerusalem in the middle of nowhere. Oh, exaggerate. Have you ever noticed? Maybe not. That religious political people over exaggerate stuff when they make statements trying to win a case? Or is that just me? That's what this is. But get this. Listen, if you had not pay attention, that would be a good place to pay attention. Today, as we sit here, in a world full of billions of people, a third of those billions think Jesus is somebody special. A couple billion people think Jesus is the Son of God, the crucified and risen Savior. These guys had no idea when they made statements about him, what was really to come. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting. This was immediately, that was one conversation. This is immediately, Lazarus is raised from the dead, and they like, okay, uh, emergency meeting. Uh, they put out the bat signal, and they all ran. They got to the meeting. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, this would be like, the Sanhedrin would be in getting the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people all together to agree. It would be like getting all the very progressive Democrats and all the very, very conservative mega Republicans all together and agree on one thing. Minor miracle, right? These guys hated each other. The Pharisees and Sadducees didn't agree. They didn't agree on a bunch of stuff. But they decided to get together because they agreed on one thing. we got to get rid of Jesus. What are we accomplishing, they said. Here's this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then what? And then we'll lose our money. And then we'll lose our power. Then we'll lose our reputation. Then we won't be in charge. They even knew. That's kind of where it hits home a little bit for us all, Brewster Shalan online. They even knew that to embrace Jesus as who he claimed to be meant they would have to let go of something. If they were going to check Jesus out, if they were going to follow him, if they were going to look into him like the rest of the world was, they were going to have to give up something. And I don't know about you, but I've been there and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to give that up. No, not today, Jesus. Let me, let me, let me. I think I can do a better job than you, creator, God Almighty. Let me have control. I don't know what's extraordinarily important to you. To these guys, it was power and popularity and wealth. But when they stood up and said, what are we going to do? We're going to lose everything. They go on and he said, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come, take away both our temple and our nation. And right away they're like, yeah, we hate the Romans. Romans weren't the issue. If we let him keep going on like this, those evil Romans are coming. That's just a political uh, red herring. If we let him go on like this, we're going to lose all the stuff we love. All the stuff that makes us somebody. So there we are, right? Jesus is going to cost us something. I mean, you give up time on a Sunday morning, cost you something, right? You decide, uh, high schoolers, middle schoolers, you're like, yeah, that's why I kind of avoid going to rendezvous. Because when I get in a small group or I listen, I'm like, yeah, there's a call from, 
from Jesus. And I'm like, nah, I'm not ready to do that. I'm not going to give up the stuff that makes me popular, the stuff that, make, that I enjoy. If you're single, God bless you. If you're middle school, high school, or whatever age, and you're dating, and you're like, yeah, listen, I don't think I'm going to find somebody if I follow Jesus. I was blessed to meet Darlene. She was 15. I was 16. So I didn't have the problem. But I had friends who did. And kind of like, don't agree with me out loud here. You can talk later at home. But it's like, okay, God, come on. There's not a lot of good-looking Christian girls out there. This is not me talking. This is my buddies. So the theory was this. Anybody can become a believer, but not anyone can become good-looking. So I'm going to date these very attractive, wicked girls instead of these Christian girls because they're not going to, that's not right. As ridiculous as that sounds, we do that all the time. I go, okay, that, that's really good, God, but I know you wouldn't want me to miss out on this. I know you don't want me not to be happy. We know what we need to do a lot of times, and maybe middle schoolers, you're still learning, but the rest of us know. We know what we're supposed to do, but the tension just is too high. The price is too high, and the tension increases. So let's turn for home real quick. So one of them, in this big meeting with the, the Republicans and Democrats, Pharisees and Sadducees, who was a high priest, Caiaphas speaks up. You guys are idiots. You don't know anything at all. Don't you realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish? And I think he said, better that one man die and just dot, dot, dot. And he's like, for the people. Because this ain't about me. I, I'm just a hum humble servant. I don't care about my wealth and my reputation. He's, he has to turn it around to make his point. Uh, and then John says, looking back, he says, he did not say this on his own, but as a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. He didn't even know he was being used by God. And that all, not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. Caiaphas is standing up and preaching the gospel, and he doesn't even know it. Because Jesus, it is better if that one man die. And that man be the perfect Savior, Messiah, Rescuer, Jesus Christ. They plotted to destroy Jesus. They got him arrested. They got Rome in on it. Caiaphas couldn't put him to death. So he had to go to Rome and say, hey, this dude's claiming to be a king. He called himself the king of Jews. So he's trying to take over Rome. Let's do something. And Rome said, go ahead and kill him. And then everything was fine. Caiaphas missed out. But it's an illustration of me. Maybe not you. You tell me. It's an illustration of people who say yes, even though it costs me. Or no, because it costs me too much. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Everything was fine. They put Jesus to death. Everything was great. Caiaphas is like... Can you imagine him? Friday, Jesus is crucified, and he's like, yeah, I'm back. Saturday, he is enjoying his day. Taking advantage, religious advantage of all the people around him, counting his money. Sunday morning, he's just getting out of bed. Someone comes running down the temple hall. Like, hey, well, it's a little early. What's going on, Caiaphas? And someone says, hey, Ka hey high priest Caiaphas, Jesus, that dude that you put to death that you've been all worried about? Yeah, his body's missing. Chung, chung. <laughs> That's funny. I wait the whole, whole, whole sermon to do that. Uh-oh. And everything that he thought he had changed. There's all these Jesus sightings for 40 days or whatever. Then all these disciples who ran away when Jesus was arrested, came back with great power because they saw the resurrected Jesus. And their message was, whoever would listen, you crucified him. God raised him from the dead. We've seen him. Say you're sorry. 
Wasn't a, there wasn't a small group. There wasn't any crusade. That was it everywhere they go. You guys did this. You better say you're sorry. You better get right with God because you missed it. Jesus is the Savior, the Rescuer. Caiaphas lost his place. He didn't stay high priest forever. He didn't stay in the temple forever. And Caiaphas just becomes like so many powerful people in the first century. Just a footnote in the story of Jesus. Hey, if you lived in first century Jerusalem, you would think, oh man, Caiaphas, is he, oh wow. He, no, but no one, you don't know who Caiaphas, you don't care anything about Caiaphas. Guess what? Don't be offended. But I think there's a little bit of Caiaphas in all of us. There's something inside of me that says, preserve at all cost. Protect what I want, what I enjoy at all cost. Listen, I've been talking about this for 40 years. Because there's a bunch of stuff in our life that are worthy goals, but they make lousy gods. You want a good GPA and get into a good college? That's a worthy goal. That's a great goal, you guys. You want to fall in love and live happily with, with a spouse and raise kids and stuff? And Yeah, that's a great goal. You want your kids to be successful parents as athletes, AAU athletes, middle school, high school athletes, get a scholarship in college? That is a fantastic goal. You want to make money and start a business and have your business and, and be able to retire and have cash when you retire and everything and, and have a nicer home or add on. That, that, yes, those are, that's a good goal. Lousy gods. Lousy gods. None of those things are going to get you through a time where you are, you've lost everything or feel like you've lost everything. None of those things are going to get you down the road into a relationship with Jesus and so you can be accepted by God Almighty. I'm not saying they're bad things to be involved with. I'm just saying if they are the thing you're holding on to and they're your God, I know that's harsh. I know that's harsh. And it's only you. I'm not telling you. You decide. You're like, oh, God, I'm glad he didn't mention my thing. I don't know what your thing is. What is it that you're holding on to that you're investing in? Your time, your energy, your money. It's not bad. It's not evil. It just doesn't make a good God. Because the value of what we have begins to diminish anyway. That thing you're holding on to, a year from now, five years from now, it's, gonna, it's not going to have any value. Most of us old people, the things we regret the most is that we held on to something when we should have surrendered, and now we look back and say, why did I do that? The little gods always disappoint and eventually, the little gods disappear. Now, it's only old people who say stuff like that, right? Right? Middle schools, high schools. This is where if we put you in a, in, in a circle in, in the Brewster Middle School, you get all the middle schoolers in the middle of the gym and, we, and all us old people stand around them. And all us old people would say, Listen, you can get this right. You don't have to go through all the pain and junk and regret that we did. You can avoid it. And all the old people, amen, brother. Or at real life, whoop, whoop. Yeah, you can get this right. You don't have to, you don't have to go through this. You have a chance at this moment to say, I am not going to be my own God. I can't be my own savior. I can't rescue myself from anything. You can be motivated and you can have goals, but if you leave out God Almighty, none of that stuff's going to be here in five years anyway. Saying yes to God will cost you something. Saying no will cost you more. Like, yeah, it's not very positive. Yeah, but it's loving. Every week, we get to this point, we have some next steps. And 
those next steps are on a, a blue card or it's digitally online. We have them in Brewster and Chelan. We want you to respond. There's no magic in the card except for that's how you can communicate best with us and give us a prayer request or let us know what's going on in your life. But we just want some next steps. We want you, especially this morning, I would hate that you would be here, listen, and like, uh, Kyle's cute and all, but eh, I'm all right. Or man, that story, that Larry boy, that's really funny, but eh, I'm okay. I would love for you to take something and say, I'm going to attempt, or I'm going to try this. Let me give you three steps and then we're done. For this is the easiest one. Identify what you have put in God's place in your life. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to talk about it. You just, it's just you. Just you and your mind or you and God. Like when I was talking, as you paid attention, what came across like, yeah, that thing's super important. I wonder if it's more important than God. Or that thing's really getting my attention. I wonder if it's going to pay off later. Uh, I know I shouldn't be investing here, but I just love it. Whatever that is. You got to start there because nothing else matters if you don't identify that thing that's captivating your time, energy, money, attend, uh, attention. What is that thing? You got to identify it. You don't even have to do anything about it. You can say, I did step one. Yep, I'm in a relationship I shouldn't be in. It's getting in the way of really experiencing the love of God. Uh, I identify it that the girl I'm dating has become God to me. Yeah. You're going to change? No. All right. Step one. Complete. Nice job. Step one. Check. Step two. Decide to surrender to Jesus. A little harder. I know that sounds scary. I just don't know after 60 years of doing this, a better option. When I study and experience the life and teaching and love of Jesus, I got nothing, I got, I got nothing else that compares to that. The majority of people I know that follow Jesus would agree with that even in the midst of their life being really out of control. There's a point in it Surrender feels, we hate that word, especially in the United States. I mean, as a country in wars, we're like 42 and 1. Vietnam. Um, like, we hate surrender. Surrender isn't like, uh, I'm nothing and I don't, I'm just a piece of... Surrender is just like, hey, God, I trust that you know better than I know. God, I trust that you exist and you care and you love me. And I am giving up because I am confident that you do a better job than what I'm doing. So I give you control. That's tough. More than worth it, though. I don't know a lot of people. I mean, I know a lot of people that struggle with faith. They're followers of Jesus and like, eh, something happened. They prayed for their grandma. Grandma didn't get better. They went through, their family went through a breakup. I know a lot of people who are like, ah, I don't, I don't know. But I don't know hardly anyone who's a follower of Jesus that said they weren't grateful at times where they gave up and gave in. And for some of us, that may be every day, every week for a while, right? I would encourage you, especially after, as we move through the Easter story and we head towards Good Friday when Jesus gave up his life for our benefit and we celebrate on Easter Sunday when he rose from the dead to prove he wasn't just a dude, I would pray that you, even if you've never ever considered moving in a direction towards God through Jesus, that this would be your day today. That you could say, God, it's your own prayer. God, I don't understand everything, but I believe something, and I believe that I want you in control instead of myself. I know that my sin, my junk, my mistakes have separated me from you because you're perfect and I'm not. And I'm inviting you into my life and choosing to follow you from this day forward. That's a prayer you can say in Brewster Middle School, sitting at your home, or right here in Chelan. 
you want to let us know on a blue card you did that, we'll follow up with you. But you don't need to come down front. You don't need to come to some special service. You make that decision right where you're at. Last. As we move through this series and into Easter, and really the rest of the year, you're going to hear me talk a lot about this. But maybe a next step for you, if you're a father of Jesus and you're like, I want to move forward. Choose to be ruthlessly invitational. Invite somebody along with you. Listen, we're not trying to grow a church. We're trying to reach a community in Shalana Manson and others, in Brewster Pateras and others. Invite somebody with you. If you're like, you've stumbled into and you find the love of Jesus and it's making a difference in your life, invite somebody along for the ride. And I love this because like, you invite someone like, yeah, I'm not a religious person. Well, neither is my church, neither is Kyle. He's the least religious person I know. I don't like organized religion. Real life's the most unorganized church I've ever been to. That's not for me. I don't like church. Great, I got a church for people who don't like church. This is real life. If you found something and you're not sharing it, it's not going to be as valuable. Look around, look around to an empty seat. You see, just go ahead, look, you can look around. Look, look around. Did you see an empty seat? That seat is anything but empty. It's waiting for you to invite someone to sit in it and they're going to experience the love of Jesus when they come here about the truth of Jesus. That may be next week. For sure, it's going to be Easter. I'm asking you, would you join us in that mission? Because we want every single person, Shalan and Manson, Pateras and Brewster, and all the surrounding areas who feel or are far from God to find real life, the real satisfying, great life, even though life has full of pain, even though there's so much stuff in there that we wish we could change, that when we depend and we surrender, that that's when we begin to experience the real life God intended for us.